Okay, welcome back. In the previous video, we looked at our first NP complete problem, which is circuit set. And we did that by proving that any other NP problem can be solved by circuit set, can be turned into a circuit where the uh, existence of a set of bits that would make the light bulb turn on in that circuit means that the original answer to the problem, the answer to the original problem is yes. And what we're going to see today is that that's not the only one. We're going to see that actually many of the problems that we have looked at over this unit are also NP complete. And let's get started with that. So we're going to look at circuit sat and then three sat and vertex cover. Three sat is this classic problem. It was introduced in the previous video very briefly, but it has to do with the Boolean formula of a certain variety. Um, so we'll, we'll look at where that is, but that's not to me as interesting as really going to vertex cover. So mostly I want to say that in the previous puzzle, we looked at turning a specific vertex cover problem into a circuit. And now we're going to try to do the other way around to turn any circuit into a vertex, into a graph where the existence of the ability to turn on the light bulb in the circuit is exists only if and only if there's a certain small vertex cover in the graph which is kind of cool. So we have to go through a few steps to make this happen. I think each step is kind of uh, believable enough, but then putting them all together, we have to remember a few things. So the first one is that we can take any circuit and convert it to NANDs only. So just remember that a NAND is this gate with a bubble on the end. So it's, um, it's x and y not. So this is the definition of NAND is that if we have our inputs, then it's true except for when both of the inputs are true. So that's a NAND gate. And it's pretty well established uh, in digital logic that you can do any circuit with only NANDs. And how is that possible? Well, if we think about our three basic gates that we usually want to deal with. So an inverter gate, how can we turn that into a NAND? Well, we can just duplicate that input line and put it into a NAND. And what you'll notice is that you're either going to be on this top line where you have zero and it turns it into a one or in this bottom line where you have a one and it turns it into a zero. And that's exactly what an inverter is supposed to do. So that's one equivalence then for how about an AND gate so we have two inputs and we AND them together that's what we want to do how can we turn that into a NAND operation well we just have a NAND and then we invert it so you can say that this is the same as if you have two inputs you NAND them together now that now the answer you have is the opposite of what you really wanted so then you just apply the inversion operation like we just saw, and now you have, in total, with two NANDs, you can get the same operation as an AND gate. And now, finally, an OR gate. How is this going to work? We have to use De Morgan's Law. So you should remember that De Morgan's Law means that one way to think about it is that you can turn an OR into an AND if you negate everything. So this is going to be the same as negating both the inputs and the output. So A or B is the same as not A and not B, and then negate that. Uh, that's from uh, De Morgan's Law that you learned in discrete math class. And now the ha we, what we have here is a NAND gate with two inverted inputs. So this is really the same if we want to draw it all out as doing this with three NAND gates. So I take each of my original inputs, I invert them, and then feed that into another NAND gate. And now I get the same operation as that original OR operation. So I can do any of my basic gates with one, two, or three NAND gates. And so that's how we know that we can take any circuit that we have that has you know normal AND and NOT and OR gates that we're used to. And remember also that things like multiplexers and decoders are actually built up of these elements. Uh, we can do the same thing with only NAND gates. 
And there might be simpler ways to do this sometimes, but this is for the purposes of doing a polynomial time reduction. We're not worried about trying to get the absolute minimal all the time just to prove that it exists and is going to have polynomial size. And what you see here is that you're only going to have three times as many gates when you convert it to NANDs only. And now what we want to think about is the, the reason why we did that is because now we really only have to think about how can I turn a NAND gate into a 3SAT formula or a vertex cover. And then we can combine that construction for many times for all the NAND gates that are in the whole circuit. So our approach is going to be how can I turn like one NAND gate into a formula or into a vertex cover and then how can I combine that together to form the, the whole thing. So first of all for 3SAT uh, let me just remind you what 3SAT means. This is what's called a conjunctive normal form. Maybe you learned about this in theory class, but it means that we have a product of sums. So in your IC220 class, you do that simplification using k-maps, um, minimization, and you end up with the sum of product forms. And this is just the opposite of that. So an example of a CNF formula is uh, if I have not x or y and x or y or z and x or not y or not z. Okay, so this is an example of a CNF formula because it's a product of sums. So each thing in the sum is either just a variable by itself or a negated variable. Then I OR them together, the pluses mean ORs, and then I have a product of all those um, terms. And a three set just means that we have at most three sums in, in each sum, at most three literals in each term. Literals per term. So I'm not allowed to do x plus y plus z plus w. I'm not allowed to do that in 3SAT. In 3SAT, I'm only allowed to do something like x plus y plus z. What's the point of making these restrictions is, well, we could think about any Boolean formula, and certainly any circuit can be turned into a Boolean formula that just kind of expresses the same thing. We're, what we're trying to do is simplify it as much as possible. The goal frequently when we're thinking about NP complete problems is we want to try to think of some simple ones, like what's the simplest problem that's NP complete, because that'll help me prove that other things are also NP complete. And so we, it turns out that the most you can simplify this down is to 3SAT. Interestingly, and I'll let you think about this yourself, if you think about 2SAT, where you would only have two literals per term, turns out you can do that in polynomial time. But with three per term, that becomes impossible for reasons that we'll see here. Uh, so now we want to say, how can we turn a NAND gate into something like this? So now let's think of a NAND gate. And I'm going to label the inputs as X and Y. And I'm going to label the output as Z. And what we want to express is not just the formula for NAND, you know, like Z equals X NAND Y, what we want to express is that if you think about all three of these as being variables, what we want to ask is when do all three of those, when is the gate working properly? So when do all three of those variables interact in a way that makes the gate operation correct? So instead of just thinking about that truth table with X and Y, we really want to think about a truth table with X, Y, and Z. So this will have eight rows since there's three variables. And what I want to think about is not the NAND operation itself, but like, is the NAND working correctly? And so what we're going to do is think about, OK, for 0 and 0, the output of the NAND should be 1. So that's going to be a 1 here, but a 0 here, because 0 NAND 0 should be 1. So if we, it's a 0, if Z is a 0 in that case, that means the NAND is not working. With 0 NAND 1, that's also a 1. So this one is working correctly. This one's not. 1 NAND 0 is also 1. So this one is working correctly. This one is not. And 1 NAND 1 is 0. So this one is working correctly, and that one is not. 
And so what we're trying to do is come up with a formula that expresses this last output. Is the NAND working correctly? And here, here it is. I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, it's X or Z and Y or Z. So one of X or Z always has to be true. And one of Y or Z always has to be true. And one of these three always has to be false. So not X or not Y or not Z. So you can also, you can kind of think of these, why does this make sense? Is you can think of these as implications. If you remember back from your discrete math class, an implication is the same as an or. So X, for example, I'll put this in, in blue, X or Z is the same as saying not X implies Z. So if X is false, then Z is true. That makes sense if you think of this as a NAND operation. So this one means when Y is false, Z has to be true. And this one means when X and Y are both true, Z has to be false. And that's exactly what it means for a NAND. And what you should notice is that this is a three CNF formula. And so we've just turned a single NAND gate into a three CNF formula. The trick is gonna be that we have to have new variables for all the intermediate wires in our circuit. So if you have a big circuit, you just make, you have the input variables like X and Y here, but all the intermediate wires, like in this case, Z, all the intermediate wires themselves become variables. So then you just have all these variables and you encode all of the NAND gate operations and then that encodes the whole circuit as a 3SAT, 3CNF formula. Okay, but what, I, what I'm really interested in is the vertex cover part. So let's see how we can take this idea and make it work for vertex covers. So for a vertex cover, the idea is gonna be that we we want to force the vertex cover to choose an assignment of variables being true or false. So let's start with just an inverter. If we have an inverter like this, and so I'll say the input is X and the output is Z. How do I force, so that's a circuit, how do I force a vertex cover to kind of choose what those variables should be? Well, you can do it by just drawing nodes with a connection. So this is going to be a single two nodes with a connection between them. That's going to represent X, where specifically this node will represent not X, and this one will represent X being true. Uh, sorry, so this, this will X represent X being false, and this will represent X being true. And the same for Z. The node over here represents Z being false, the node over here represents Z being true. And so why am I saying that this, this kind of forces the vertex cover to choose? Well, Think about it. Remember, a vertex cover is a selection of vertices that covers, that touches every edge. So anytime you have an edge, at least one of the endpoints of that edge has to be in the vertex cover. And now if we're looking for a minimum vertex cover for this particular graph, any minimum vertex cover is going to have two vertices, and it's going to be one of the choices for X and one of the choices for Z. So any minimum vertex cover in this graph is essentially choosing should X be zero or one and should Z be zero or one? Okay, so that's a crucial idea. That's cool. But that's not enough to say that this circuit is is represented here because um, in this circuit, it's impossible that X and Z are both true, for example. But in the vertex cover, of course, you could choose this vertex over here and this vertex over here for Z and have and say, okay, they're both true. I have a vertex cover. So we have to add into this um, graph something to force the operation of the of the inverter to be correct and so if we think about this as as a formula i didn't even write this on the last slide but it's the cnf formula for this inverter is that x or z one of them has to be true and not x or not z one of them has to be false that kind of makes sense for an inverter gate one thing has to be true and one thing has to be false it can be either way but that's that's how an inverter works and so now how do we represent these or conditions in the graph? We just add extra edges. So what does it mean that X or Z has to be true? I just add an edge there to say that one of those two endpoints of that edge has to be true. And now for not X or not Z, I'm going to just add an edge right there. So I end up with this box shape and that forces that the only two uh, size two vertex covers are kind of two corners where x is zero and y is one 
or where x is 1 and y is 0. Anything else would either be a larger vertex cover or wouldn't be a vertex cover at all. So what we've just done is, is made a graph for this simple inverter circuit that the size, uh, the existence of any size 2 vertex cover in this graph corresponds to a way of making this circuit work correctly. So now we want to extend that idea out to what we were really interested in, which is a NAND gate. So let's think about that. We have a NAND gate with X and Y as inputs and Z as an output. And just remember from the last slide, we already figured out that this can be encoded as X or Z and Y or Z and not X or not Y or not Z. Okay, so now how are we going to turn that into a vertex cover? We will do the same thing, first of all, of starting out with these straight lines, one for x, one for y, and one for z. Because again, that forces the choice of zero or one for each of these variables, which is great. Now we have to also encode these conditions of the NAND gate working correctly. So these simple ones are, are easy. We can do the same as before. So like x or z, that just means that we draw an edge between, oh, on the other side, between x being true and z being true. So this forces that one of these two variables has to be set to true, which is exactly the same as having this in our Boolean formula. Okay, and then we do the same thing with y or z, just makes an edge right there. And now this one is the tricky part, not x or not y or not z. How do we force one of these three to be set to true? If we drew a bunch of edges between them, that would actually force two of, out of the three to be false, but we only need one out of the three to be false. And so the trick, which is a brilliant idea, so I wouldn't expect you to come up with this, but I, I hope that you enjoy it. I remember when I first learned this and I was like, whoa, that's cool, uh, is we make another three vertices. They don't, these don't mean anything. They don't correspond to variables, but we make three vertices in a triangle. And what's special about a triangle in terms of a vertex cover is that any vertex cover for this triangle has to cover two out of the three vertices, at least. Right, if you only cover one of the three vertices, then the opposite edge is not covered. So you got to get two of these three vertices in your vertex cover, no matter what. And then I'm going to connect each vertex to not x and to not y and to not z. So now I have... Definitely two out of these three vertices have to be covered, but I also have these three edges connecting away from them. So what that means is that for whatever vertex is not covered, so one of these vertices is not need to be part of the vertex cover, but then, like let's say I choose these two as part of my vertex cover, then I have to choose not y also as part of my vertex cover. So it's kind of forces in whichever one of these three is not part of the triangle has to be part of uh, one of these Boolean assignments. And so this ends up having this graph right here with now twice as many plus three vertices and roughly that many edges encodes and has a small vertex cover if and only if this circuit is working correctly and has an assignment of X, Y, and Z that work. And so now we know how to turn any inverter or any NAND gate in a circuit into um, equivalent edges and nodes in a vertex cover that kind of forces the assignment to correspond. So now let's look at an example to make this real. Here's our starting circuit. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. Hi, there was another example that I was about to do here, but it ends up being too long. So I'm cutting it out from the recording. It's going to be a little bit of an awkward cut, and we're going to do some practice with this in class. Okay. Okay, so if you count this up, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 vertices. That is uh, the minimum vertex cover in this graph. And if you check the assignment of variables, x being 1 and y being 0, that exactly corresponds to a 1 and a 0 here in the original circuit. And if we run these through 1 or 0 is 1, the 0 gets negated to 1. So now we have an AND and the output is 1 which means that the light bulb turns on and we're happy. So the existence of a small vertex cover here exactly corresponds to 
whether you can turn the light bulb on in this original circuit. This means that vertex cover and 3SAT are both NP complete because we knew that vertex cover is in NP. We proved that a week ago or something. And now we also know that circuit SAT reduces in polynomial time to vertex cover. That's what we just proved here. But circuit SAT was already NP hard. So therefore, um, we can say that VC is NP hard and a member of NP, so VC is NP complete. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of reductions like this. So I'll mention a couple more. So we just, what do we, what do we start with? So circuit sat is kind of our starting point, our original NP hard problem. And we said that can, 3SAT can solve that, so therefore 3SAT is also NP complete, and vertex cover also. But now think about what we already knew about vertex cover. We saw like a week ago, we did a reduction from vertex cover to hit set, the hitting set problem. And because hit set is also an NP, now that's also NP complete, right? So we already had that reduction from vertex cover to hit set. Now that we know that vertex cover is NP hard, that also tells us that hit set is NP hard. Therefore, hit set is NP complete since it's a member of NP as well. Uh, we can also reduce, which I won't have time to do in this video, and it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class, but I encourage you to look it up because it's kind of cool. You can reduce vertex cover to Hamiltonian cycle. So the vertex cover problem, if there's a small vertex cover, that can be reduced to the problem of finding a path that goes around all the vertices in a graph, a cycle. And that one can be reduced to traveling salesman problem. And so this means that the traveling salesman problem is also NP complete. So just to kind of uh, close this off a little bit, yeah, there's many known uh, NP complete problems. And if I wanna prove that a new problem is NP complete, the important thing is I never have to say like from any NP problem, do that whole reduction. All I have to do is to prove that something is NP complete, you first need to prove that it's a member of NP. That means that you have a short certificate and a fast verifier. So that's still necessary. And then the other part is to prove that it's NP hard is you just need one reduction from any uh, NP complete problem. So the nice thing is that we have this kind of arsenal of known NP complete problems. And if I have a new problem, the the trick of trick, finding that my new problem is NP complete is really finding a similar enough existing NP complete problem and trying to do the reductions from that one. And one thing that's interesting is that all of these have one-sided verifiers, meaning that we can easily check if the answer is yes, but not if it's no. If we think back to um, vertex cover, how can you check if the answer is yes to this ver this graph having a size 11 vertex cover? Well, you just check these red vertices that I circled, check that they cover every single edge. They do. And so therefore, this definitely has a size 11 vertex cover. But if the answer were no, it's very hard. There's no way that I could quickly convince you that the answer would be no. You would have to kind of check a lot of things, um, really an exponential number of things. Nobody knows how to do that. And that's an interesting reason why the one of our original motivations was thinking about cryptography, the factorization problem, it turns out that you can check a uh, no answer. So if you remember, um, the factorization problem is, as a decision problem, uh, checking whether or asking whether a given large number has a small factor, has a factor less than k. And if the answer is yes, of course, you can check that quickly by saying, here's the factor less than k. But if the answer is no, you can also check that by producing the certificate is the complete prime factorization. And because we can check whether a number is prime or not quickly, and we can multiply them out and check that they equal the same thing. So if you give me, so for example, 91, so if the input is 91 and five, so the question is, does 91 have a factor less than five? The answer is no. 
How could I prove to you that the answer is no? Is my certificate would be seven times 13. 91 equals seven times 13. You can check that seven and 13 are both prime. They're both bigger than five. And when you multiply them out, you get 91. And so you can quickly check a no answer as well as a yes answer. And that means that factorization is almost certainly not NP complete. Probably not NP complete. So even though we don't have any polynomial time algorithm for that, and there's definitely a lot of people that believe that there is no polynomial time algorithm to compute factorizations, we also know that it's not NP complete. So it's what's sometimes called NP intermediate. It's like between P and NP. And so the picture kind of gets more complicated um, as time goes on. But what's interesting is that this, this, the fact that it's not MP complete seems to be related to the fact that it can be factorization can be solved quickly by quantum computers. But the, these NP complete problems seemingly cannot be. Um, so there's a lot of work in cryptography to try to base cryptography on MP complete problems like hitting set or vertex cover or something um, instead of on factorization, which can be solved quickly by quantum computers. So in terms of our current classical computers, factorization and vertex cover and, and ham cycle, they all can't be done in polynomial time. But it uh, turns out that these NP complete problems are really important for thinking about what's resistant to quantum computer attacks. And so this is uh, some, of the, some of the questions that we've kind of talked about a little bit um, and what are the beliefs of everyone. Uh, but we really can't prove that any of these things are defin definitively true, like fact not being NP complete because the fact is that we, we still don't know whether P equals NP. So if P equals NP, all these questions kind of become trivial. Um, if P equals NP, then factorization and all these other things can be done in polynomial time and still no one can prove that it's not. Um, but these are some of the, uh, when we're talking about one way functions, this really means crypto. And uh, as we kind of mentioned before, if you think about it, the nature of cryptography is that you can quickly check the answer. And so if P equals NP, um, at least some of the notions of cryptography that we, we think of kind of don't exist or, or aren't possible. Um, and quantum computers can solve some problems like factorization, but don't seem to be able to solve any NP hard problems. Um, and we also talked about the role of randomness. So this is just some of the questions that researchers are thinking about as they think about these complexity classes and stuff. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed our little foray into it in this class. And that's it for this unit. We'll start on new things um, next time just to kind of finish off the semester with a little bit of fun. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>